Hey everyone, it's James Q. Quick from Learn, Build, Teach, and I want to welcome you to another mini course called Build a Quiz App with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now this course is going to per be perfect for you if you're looking to improve your core web development skills because we're not going to use any frameworks, no libraries, no Angular, no React, no Vue, just plain old core HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now let's talk a little bit about the features and things that we're going to use in this course. We'll use some ES features, features like const and let. We'll talk about the spread operator. We'll talk about arrow functions and then other JavaScript features as well. A few of the array functions like splice and map. We'll use local storage. And then in CSS, we're going to use Flexbox. We'll talk about animations and rim units. Now we're going to take all of those things to build some pretty cool functionality into this application. We're going to store high scores in local storage. We're going to dynamically request and retrieve questions from the open trivia db api we're going to build a spinning loader from scratch we'll build a progress bar from scratch and i think it looks really good and i think this is really great core web development stuff that you guys uh, are going to want to learn how to do so again i want to thank you for coming to the course i want you to know that there will be resources for you to follow as well there's a link in the description to the github page that you guys will have access to all the source code Part one through part 12, I think is how many we have. So never fear if you can't get something or if you have something going wrong, you can always go and grab that source code. And then in there, I've included uh, links to additional resources if you need to do some additional reading or learning along the way. So again, I wanna thank you guys for checking out the course. I'm really excited that you're here and I'm really excited for this course. I really enjoyed recording it and creating it myself. I just wanna leave you guys with one additional resource if you're interested in checking out more of my content, my videos, my courses, you can head on over to learnbuildteach.com and you can subscribe to my newsletter to get notification about all of those things as well. So again, just wanna thank you and welcome you to the course. I hope that you enjoy it and I hope you're ready to improve your core web development skills. All right guys, so we're gonna go ahead and get started by creating our homepage. So we're gonna need a, an index, HTML, and an app CSS. So in the index HTML, we basically want a starter HTML5 template. In VS Code, you can do uh, exclamation and then tab, and this will give you the scaffolding for an HTML file. So I'm gonna change the title here to quick quiz, and I think that's good. So we're gonna add a, a few different things in here. One that I forgot is actually uh, a link to our CSS, so we'll need to add that and uh, this is called app CSS, so we'll change that from index to app CSS. So now we've got uh, HTML file. We can add, let's just add an H1 here to test that this is working. And what we're gonna do, or what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna use uh, something called the live server extension uh, to open our application on local host, and uh, it basically creates a live reloading server, which you'll see what that means in a second. So if you want this extension, uh, under extensions it is called live server here so go ahead and install that and then when you've got it uh, sometimes you get an option that pops up down here uh, but i can always right click and then do open with live server so what this is going to do and it actually opened on the wrong page for me a wrong instance of chrome so let me bring this over here and what this does again it started a uh, local host server actually on, a, um, on an ip here and then at port 5500 and so as I start uh, changing this to be quick quiz, quiz, if I change this and save, this is gonna automatically refresh in our browser. So this is gonna make it really easy for us to see the changes as we make them and uh, just kind of speed up our, our process. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna scaffold out this HTML and then we're gonna style it and we're gonna finish up the homepage uh, in this video. So uh, what I want, um, and as I'm doing this, I'm gonna give another note. So uh, Emmet are uh, snippets or abbreviations that you can use in HTML and CSS built into VS Code. If you've never used these before, definitely check out uh, the Emmet docs and I can pull open Emmet docs. I can pull open this here for you. So docs.emmet.io. This is gonna incredibly speed up your HTML and CSS development. So definitely uh, check it out and then just kind of follow what I'm doing if you can. If you've never done it, you might go do some practice, uh, but you can pause the video and catch up if you need to. So uh, by typing dot container and then tab, this is an uh, Emmet abbreviation to create a div with a class of container. If I did uh, a hashtag of container, 
uh, that would give me a div with an ID of container. So by default, uh, your Emmet abbreviations are going to give containers, then you can, or excuse me, divs, and then you can give it classes or IDs, things like that. So uh, speaking of IDs, inside of this, I'm going to have an ID called home, because this is going to be our home page. And then I'm going to give it a couple of classes, uh, Flexbox helper classes that we're going to create in a second, and we'll talk about what Flexbox is. So this is going to have uh, flex center and flex column, and then I'll tab it over. So now I've got a div inside of my container div with an ID of home and a class of flex center and flex column. Inside of here, I want to have an H1 that's, that does say quick quiz. And then we'll also have a couple of uh, anchor tags to link to other pages in our application. One, the actual game, so the play button, and then a high scores button to go and view the high scores. So uh, what this is gonna be is an anchor tag with an href2 game HTML. And then uh, we can also add some styling to this and we're gonna make it look like a button even though it is uh, an anchor tag. So, so I just wanna make a copy of this line and then I'll change it from game to high scores and then change uh, the text here from uh, game or play to high scores as well. So these are going to be two uh, buttons that we'll see on our page. Uh, obviously, this looks really terrible right now. And so we're going to open up our CSS file to, so we can start styling these things. But we've got all the HTML here that we need. We just need to go in and add uh, support for all these classes and things like that. So in our app CSS, uh, one thing I want to talk about is using, let's see, using rim in CSS. Now, rim gives you the ability to to define your font sizes or margins and paddings relative to the, the root font size, basically. So if you change that root font size, anything using a rim will change accordingly as well. And I'll show you uh, kind of exactly why we want to do this in a second. So you can read through uh, some different, uh, different articles on this. There's lots of content on it, but this is a pretty common thing that a lot of people use instead of pixels, for example, in this situation. So the way we're gonna set this up is we're gonna use our root selector, and that basically just becomes our HTML tag. Uh, one, we're gonna set the background color to ECF5FF, and uh, we should see a change here. It was very subtle, it's a very light color. It's almost a white, but it's got a little bit of, of blue in it. So that's gonna be our background color. And then now, we're gonna change our font size to 62.5 percent now this looks really weird the reason this is 62.5 percent the default font size in most browsers is 16 pixels so 62.5 percent of 16 if you do the numbers is 10 pixels so now the root size uh, the root font size is going to be 10 pixels so anything uh, that we reference with rims will be based on that uh, 10 pixels so we'll come back to that in a second so the first thing i'm going to add is box sizing border box now what this means is if I add a border to a box, uh, it's gonna include the width of that border in the calculation, calculated size of the uh, that box. So if I have a box that's 40 pixels by 40 pixels and I add a five pixel border without box sizing set to border box, that'll really make your uh, square uh, 50 by 50 instead of uh, 40 by 40. So with border box, that means that the 40 by 40 is going to include your box sizing. So that's what we want. So we'll have that. Then we'll have uh, just set some font family stuff. And we're going to use Arial, Helvetica, Sans Serif. Not going to get too fancy here. Uh, then I want to reset basically all of the margin and padding. So we're going to we're gonna make sure that we control all of the margin and padding in our app. And then uh, the text color that we're going to use is uh, 333. So the reason uh, using text color a little bit off from black, black is, it can be pretty harsh. You probably won't see much of a difference here when I save. Uh, well, you'll see the, the, uh, the spacing change and the color here is a little bit different. It's not as harsh as a pure black, so it's just something a little bit off. So I'm gonna co copy in a few things. Um, I'm gonna set a default margin bottom for our H1 through H4 tags. And then I'm going to overwrite these a little bit I'm gonna copy in some of these styles so that you guys save a little bit of time coding them, you guys can see. So what we're doing is we're saying uh, H1, the font size is gonna be 5.4 rim 
and rim again is going to be relative to that root font size so this is basically going to be 5.4 times 10 pixels which is 54 pixels and then the color is going to be a blue color and then we've got a margin bottom here and then similar stuff um we'll come back to this band that's going to be used later on but i've kind of got it in here anyway and then uh, h2 is going to be for 42 pixels and then a margin of 40 pixels font weight is going to be bold or excuse me not bold h1 was bold and then our h3 is going to be 28 pixels font weight of 500. so when i save this you'll see now this is going to refresh this is going to be what our h1s are going to look like with this blue color it's going to be pretty big and then we still got to style our links down here all right, so now I'm gonna get into creating uh, some of our, I call them utility classes. So usually in my CSS, I will uh, leave a comment here and just type out uh, utilities. And uh, the first thing we're gonna start with is container. Now this is gonna be, uh, the goal here is to provide some padding and uh, to pad provide some padding, padding on the outside, but what we wanna do is center uh, all of our stuff in basically in the screen. So we want this, uh, this to take up the entire view width so this will make it 100 percent of the view width and then the height will be 100 of the view height as well so this is going to make basically take it make it take up the entire page and then we'll have display of flex and uh, we'll talk a little bit about flexbox is what flexbox is here in just a second uh, with flexbox we've got justify content center and align items center i think if we save this we'll go ahead and see some see a difference here so with flexbox which is relatively new in css it uh centering things is incredibly easier than it used to be in the past so uh what happened here is display flex uh turns this container into a flexbox container and then since it's taking up this entire height and width of the page justify content will center things horizontally by default and then allied items will center things vertically by default. So if I started this, uh, the line items to flex start, for example, that's going to pull things up to the top. If I undid that and did uh, justify content flex end, for example, it's going to push everything to the right. So uh, flexbox is definitely something you'll uh, you'll want to spend some time with if you haven't before. But just know that these three lines allow me to center things horizontally, horizontally and vertically. All right, and then my max width i want to be 80 80 rem so basically what i'm doing here is let me do an inspect here and i'll show you it looks like i've got a typo here so this should be 80 rem with no space now if i select so if you look at if i hover over my container see that it, it stopped at this 800 pixels which is right about in here and then it has uh this extra content to the right so what i want to do is set a margin zero auto to go ahead and center that content as well so this will this will just kind of make sure that as my screen gets bigger there will be some padding but as it gets smaller it will take up the entire screen with that 100 viewport width and viewport height but still keep it centered so that's all we're doing there is really just trying to keep all of our stuff centered inside of our application all right, and then on top of this, I'm gonna add um, any child of my container. I wanna make sure that its width is 100% uh, so that things can think we can continue to style things, or excuse me, center things horizontally. So I'm gonna uh, paste in just a few more styles here. You guys can grab them from the source code just to kind of speed this up a bit. Uh, so what I've got here is flex column will give you a flex box and then it will set the direction to uh, column. So typically, uh, or by default, uh, flex box direction is horizontal. Now we're flipping that direction to be uh, to be vertical, so it's going to stack things on top of each other. Notice how play and high scores got stacked on top of each other. Flex center is going to align uh, both justify content and align items to center. Justify center will just do uh, justify content center. Uh, text center will align uh, things in the center. Align text center. And then hidden will hide things if we need to, which we'll get to later on in the course. So uh, just to kind of reinforce some of the things that you're saying, one, we've got that container, which is a flex box. It's going to center the, the main content of the page on the page. The home also has a flex center and flex column, which means this is going to be a flex box with a vertical direction. So it's going to stack things on top of each other like this. And then it's uh, got flex center. So it's centering all of that content as well. 
and then we've got our our app name and then our two buttons so the last thing we need to do is actually style our buttons and so I'm gonna come in and create a section with a comment called buttons so I'm just gonna paste in some of this button code and then I'll talk you through it so we've got our, our class of button and this is being applied to an anchor tag but obviously we want to make it look like a button so we've got a font size here with basically 18 pixels we've got some padding we've got a fixed width we've got centered text uh, we've got a border here of one pixel basically 0 0.1 rim we've got a margin bottom you need to set text decoration to none because by default anchor tags are underlined so we don't want that and we've got the color of the text and the background color so save that and we'll see the buttons pop up and look pretty good over here on the right and then also we've got a hover state so the hover state we want to set the cursor to pointer we'll add a, a drop shadow here and we're still using that blue color to do that drop shadow with a little bit of transparency and then we'll do a transform so we're basically going to move this thing up just a bit uh, i think it's i guess that's one pixel and then we'll do a transition so we're going to not just jump to that position we're going to let it transition over the course of a short period of time so as i hover on these buttons you can see that effect now these are pretty common styles for hover effects so you're almost always going to do your cursor as a pointer a lot of people add drop shadows and then do a, a little tiny transform just to kind of give that nice little subtle effect and then i want to show you uh at some point later on we will have a disabled button uh, and that will that will come when we're looking to accept high scores so we've created this for now basically what it's going to do is it's going to uh, change the cursor so instead of pointer it's going to show something that basically says you can't click and then it's not going to do that box shadow and transform so we'll talk about that more when we get to that video but for now uh, you can see we've got a pretty good looking home page these anchor uh, anchor links will work but uh, game HTML doesn't exist just yet and high scores HTML doesn't exist yet either so that's gonna do it for this first video in the next one we're actually gonna go ahead and create our game page and go and scaffold out uh, the layout of our game so I will see you in the next one okay so we're ready for uh, part two here where we're going to scaffold out our game page so what we're gonna need to do first is create a game HTML file and then we'll also go ahead and head and create our game CSS file so in game uh, we can do kind of the same thing we did with our index one uh, use this emit abbreviation to get uh, scaffolding and then we can call this uh, quick yeah quick quiz and then just call this play I guess something like that all right so we've got got that index um, HTML or the game HTML file created now if we if we click on our play button we should be taken to this blank screen which is good that's what we want so uh, in here, everything, every one of our pages is gonna uh, be inside of a container, and then we'll have, then we'll have an ID of game, and then a class of justify center, and uh, flex column. So these are uh, two of the ones that we saw in the last one as well. And then just inside of here, I'm gonna have an H2, and this is gonna be our question. Say, so what is the answer to, to this question? And this will also have, since we're going to need to reference this, just want to give this an ID of question. So uh, let's go ahead and go to our play screen and you'll see, you'll see that we've got it and it's showing our H2, but it doesn't uh, have that background of the container and it's not centering our content. That's because we didn't include our app CSS. So we're going to include the, the app CSS here. Oh, if I could type it right, app CSS. And now, uh, now it looks a little bit more of what we expect. Now we will have enough uh, styling in here for the game page itself that we're actually going to create and include our uh, game CSS as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that while I'm thinking about it. So this is gonna include the game CSS. Okay, so we've got our question up here and now we're going to need uh, four different uh, answer choices. So what I'm gonna do, and, and this will become a little bit more apparent as we style it, I'm going to start with a class of choice container now this is going to be the overall uh, container for our choice obviously pretty self-explanatory and then inside of that we're going to have a p tag with a class of choice prefix and the prefix is basically going to be a b c or d all right so this one this first one's going to be a and we're also going to have a p tag with a class of choice text so this is going to be choice one so look at this 
it should show up here really tiny actually which is fine we'll come back and style that and we're gonna need four different ones of this so one two three four just copy and paste in that so uh, this will be choice two and it'll be uh, B and then we'll have C and choice three and then D will be choice four so now if you save this this is the this is the overall layout for our choices all right so now we're gonna go ahead and style this stuff since we already have it all laid out so we're gonna start with our choice container and we want this to be a display of flex again we're gonna set some margin on the bottom between the between the different uh, answer choices which will be 0 0.5 rem uh, we want uh, this to take up the entire width, so we're going to make this uh, width of 100%. The font size will be 1.8 rem. And then uh, we're going to give it a border, so a 0 0.1 rem solid. And then we'll use an RGB here so that we can uh, do some transparency in the end. So this is going to be 86, 165 to 35 and then an opacity of 0 0.25 so it'll just make it a really subtle uh really subtle color for us and then the last thing is the background color will be white so you can see it's got the background color white it's got the uh, border it doesn't have any padding or anything so the way we're going to do this is these individual items inside of here will have uh have their own padding and this is so that if you look at uh this Notice that uh, the blue color fills up the entire box here. So this is why we're gonna have this inner element at its own padding instead of padding on the container itself. I hope that makes sense. So uh, to do that, we're gonna do our choice prefix. And we're gonna say padding is 1.5 rim on top and bottom and then uh, 2.5 rim on the uh, sides and then our background color is going to be our blue color so five six a five e b i think that's right and we'll set the color of that text to white so this should be looking a lot better here so those are looking good now we need to do our choice text and we just really want to do some padding on here so we'll do 1.5 rim if I spell it correctly. All right, so that's looking pretty good. The only thing we're missing here is the hover state. And the hover state is gonna be uh, basically exactly what we did with our buttons. Uh, so we're gonna do choice container and then hover. And then we're gonna say cursor pointer. We'll do, and I'm just gonna copy these in because we've used them before. So I can actually grab it from our app CSS, grab the hover stuff, copy it over paste it in and then uh, this should look pretty good right you can see those answer choices with a nice little hover effect so uh, b just a kind of a side note if we were using something like SAS uh, we could reuse uh, this this little piece of code here to create a mix in in SAS so that we could reuse it instead of just copying and pasting the code over to different parts of our our application here uh, so we're not doing that so this is kind of where we are we could do a give each of these each of these things so an extra class and then add the hover state like a, a honestly a hover class maybe or something like that uh, but this is what we got for now which I think is fine because we're, we're only going to use that uh, in those two places which is good so we've got our game page uh, created and styled with obviously dummy content in the next video we're going to go and load all of our choices from an array of questions and then handle moving through questions as the user tries to answer them so that's gonna do it for this video and I'll see you in the next one. All right, so to be able to dynamically update our questions and pull them from an array, we're gonna need a game JS file. That's where we're gonna do all of that stuff. And just to make sure that it gets included, we need to come into our game HTML and do a script tag uh, referencing game JS. And we can just check that this is working by doing a console log saying hello. Oops, actually, if we could type this correctly hello world from game so if we save this and then do an inspect here and open up our console you should see that log statement there which is great I'm gonna actually give since we're gonna be doing a little bit more JavaScript stuff 
I'm going to put these side by side and give a little bit more room to the code or excuse me to the browser so that we can pull open our uh, console every once in a while when we need to see something in JavaScript. So we've got this thing working. Now uh, we need to get a reference in our in our JavaScript to several pieces of our of our HTML elements. And so the first one is our question. So it's got an ID of question uh, that makes sense. Then uh, to get a reference to this choice text, this is these this is the text for the choice, the answer choice that we need to update. To get a reference to this, we could give each of these an ID and have it be you know choice one, choice two, choice three, choice four. Uh, but there's a better way to do that. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to query based on the class choice text. And that'll give us a list of those choices and then we'll update from there now we're also going to add a little piece of information to each of these so that we can distinguish between them so data number one uh, basically this is going to be a custom data attribute that we're going to add to each of these and we'll use this in a minute uh, but this is just going to be one two three four and this is so that we can different differentiate between these uh, these different choices when we query uh, when we select all of them so we'll kind of see what that means in a second so a couple of things that we want to do is we want to uh, get a reference to the question so question equals and if you've never done uh, DOM querying uh, right now we're gonna do document .get element by ID and uh, this ID is gonna be question all right, and we're gonna do a lot of these uh, get by ID. So I've got a shortcut here for get ID. Uh, that's the snippet that I created in VS Code. You can look into creating snippets yourself uh, and kind of set something up like this. And I can show you what it looks like for in my JavaScript. Uh, so get element by ID. This is what the snippet looks like. So if you wanna go and add the snippet in there yourself, you can. And what it does is it'll probably be easier just to show it. So if I trigger this, it's gonna scaffold out uh, all this stuff and then I just type in what I want to be getting. So we don't have another uh, by ID right now, but I'm just kind of showing you guys in general, I could have done get ID question and that would have done all that stuff for me much quicker. So snippets in general are, are pretty useful and you might, uh, as you do things repetitively, you might go ahead and add some of those uh, in VS Code. So the next thing we want is our choices. So again, this is going to be uh, pulling from uh, basically a class name. So want to do get elements by class name and that class name is going to be choice choice text and I want to show you just the log here of choices so this is where we want to have our console open so choices is actually going to be an HTML collection it's a node list is what it is or actually maybe HTML collection is different than a node list so if you do a query selector all it gives you a node list uh, here it's an HTML selection uh, but regardless of that, we want to convert this to an array so that we can do uh, use some array functions on it. So we can do that by saying array, array dot from, and then passing in that uh, HTML collection as the parameter. So save this and then we'll refresh and now you'll see that we've got an array of these four different choices. And inside of here, you can see there's a property called data set. Data set is where you add custom properties and it's anything that's prefixed with data will basically become a property on that node. So it strips out the data dash part and then it just takes number and whatever value you give it here. So that's where our custom attribute is that we'll use in a second. All right, so we're gonna need to create a couple of variables here. We're gonna do a current question variable and it's gonna be an object that we'll talk about in a minute. We're going to create a variable for accepting answers and this is so that we can create a delay after someone answers, we create like a second delay before we let them answer again. We're going to need a score that's going to start at zero. We'll need a question counter, which is at zero as well. So this is basically what number, what question are you on? Then we'll have an empty array of available questions. And available questions is basically going to be a copy of our full question set. And we're going to take questions out of the available questions array as we use them so that we can always find a unique question to give the user. And then I've got a questions array with some dummy data in here. So I'm gonna copy this thing in and you guys can grab this from the source code or take your time and pause and, and paste this in if you need to. 
what this is, is each question is gonna be an object. It's gonna have a question field, which is actually the question. It's gonna have a choice one, two, three, and four. And then it's gonna have, uh, it's gonna tell you which one is the answer. And I didn't do, didn't do answers this uh, integer as zero base indexing. It's actually starting at one. So this one means it's gonna be this top one here. You probably figured that out by the question. Uh, so the way we can use this is we can dynamically ac get access to this choice uh, or excuse me, check to see if the choice is correct basically by seeing if the number in that choice uh, matches up with our answer. So we'll see, we'll see more specifically what that means in a minute. And just a few more things we needed to do. Uh, we need to create a couple of constants. These are gonna be a few things necessary for the game itself. So one is the correct bonus. So when you get a answer correct, how much is it worth? And we're gonna say 10, you could tweak this if you wanted. And then the second thing is uh, max questions. And we're gonna start off with three. So this is gonna be how many questions does uh, a user get before they finish the, uh, before they finish basically. So let's start by, uh, let's create a start game. And we'll just do a couple of things in here. So we're gonna set the question counter just make sure that it's starting at zero. It probably is, but just we're gonna basically use this as a reset. Then we're gonna set the score. And then we're going to say available questions. We're gonna copy in all the questions from the questions array. And you can use the spread operator here, which is three, uh, three dots. And what this is saying is take this array, spread out each of its items and put them into a new array. And that's what available questions is gonna be. So if I do a log of available questions, it's gonna be, oh, we actually have to call the start game function. So at the very bottom here, this is what we will do eventually is call start game. And so now you'll see that available questions is basically a full copy of the questions array. And the reason we need to do that, if we, if we just assigned available questions to questions, when we make changes to either one, it's going to affect the other. They're both going to be pointing to the same thing. We actually want it to be a full copy, which is why we do the spread operator to get a full copy of all those questions from the questions array into available questions. All right, so the last thing we're gonna do in start game is called get new question, and that's a function that we need to create here. So let's copy this, that's gonna be our next function. And uh, I didn't mention this, but I'm using uh, arrow syntax fat arrow syntax, uh, ESX for ESX functions. And this just gives you a, a more concise uh, way to write functions. So this is the function name. Uh, it, these are the parameters. If you don't have any parameters, you need to uh, have the open and close parens. If you just have one param, you can just type it in without the parens. Uh, but we don't have any, so we need to have the open and close there. So the first thing we wanna do is take that question counter. And we just wanna say plus plus. So uh, when we start the game, this will increment it to one. Now we need to get a random question. Uh, so what we're gonna do, and I can show you guys in here, we wanna get a random number between zero and three. So uh, the math.random random function by itself will give you a decimal between zero and one. If you want to get an integer out of that, you can do uh, multiply that times a number, so times three, for example, this will give you a, uh, a number between, between uh, zero and three. And then if we wanted to make that an integer, we can do a math floor on this to take uh, the lower number of this. And just notice as I kind of keep running through this, it's gonna give me a random number here, uh, which is what we want. So I'm gonna take this and copy it. And instead of hard coding this to three, I'm gonna say available questions dot length, because that's gonna change. So if we start with three questions and we use one, then we're only gonna have uh, one or two questions left in our available questions. So we always wanna base this on the length of that array. So we're gonna assign this to a variable called question index. And uh, I'm gonna get a reference to the current question by getting it out of the available questions array, available questions, and then use our question index and now I want to set the question uh, the HTML element the inner text to be the current question so the question that we just loaded and its question property so when I say this uh, let's see inner text what I do wrong here Did I misspell it 
No, it looks like I have misspelled question here. You guys probably saw that a long time ago. Sorry about that. But notice that when I save and refresh this page, it's actually pulling one of those questions uh, and displaying it correctly, which is awesome. So we want to do basically the same kind of thing for uh, each of our choices. So what we can do is we can grab our choices. We can say for each. And this is going to iterate through each of those choices. It's going to give us a reference to each choice. And then inside of here, we want to get that uh, that number from the data set property. So if you remember, we set that uh, data number property here. We want to get a reference to that number. And so we can do that by saying choice dot data set and then give me the number property out of it. So that's how you get access to those custom attributes. And then we can say choice dot enter text is current question. So out of the current question, we want to get choice and then we want to use that number to get the choice out of it. So if you look at our array here, uh, questions, each question has choice one, two, three, four. So this way we can grab the choice property here. We can get the data attribute number associated with it and we can use that to get uh, to get the actual appropriate choice out of the current question. Hopefully that makes sense for you guys. So let me save this. Now you'll see that our when I refresh, the not only is the question being populated, let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see it a little bit better. All right, so not only is the question being populated, but so are all of the choices. Now one thing I'm looking at here that uh, we probably should do is on our container, we'll just add, where's container in here, container, container. We'll add some padding. So if we get to a smaller screen, we'll add, let's say, two rim on either side. So this will just give us a little bit of padding here to make sure that it's not right up against the edge. All right, so a couple, there's actually a few more things we need to do here. Uh, one, we need to take that available questions array and we need to splice out uh, the question that we just used. So we wanna use that question index. So that's gonna tell it where to splice out and then we wanna splice out one. So this is gonna take the available questions array and it's gonna get rid of that question that we just used because again, when we get our new question, we don't wanna be able to choose from that existing, uh, from the question, from questions that we've already used. And the last thing in here, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and do this now. Accepting answers is gonna be true. So after we've loaded our question, then we wanna go ahead and say, yeah, let's go ahead and allow a user to answer. And uh, we actually want to set this to false originally so that they can't answer before we're ready and have everything loaded. So this is getting to be a long video. So uh, we're going to try to work through this for just a few more minutes. Now we want to do another uh, for each on our choices outside. And we want to grab each choice. And we want to add an event listener. So add an event listener. And this is going to be a click. And it's going to take... Uh, the event as an argument and then inside of here uh, I can just kind of log out e.target so we can see what's going on so for each one of these as we click uh, we should see the element as it finishes reloading so there's the one there's another one there's another one there's another one so we're able to click and get a reference to which choice they clicked now we need to basically take this data attribute number and check to see the real answer choice. So we won't quite do that yet. What we're gonna do is first, if we're not accepting answers, so if we're not ready for them to answer, we're just gonna return. We're gonna ignore the fact that they clicked on it. Uh, then we're going to set accepting answers to false because we're, we're gonna end up having a little bit of a delay here. We don't want them to click immediately. Uh, and then I'm just going to get a reference to a few things. So get uh, const selected, selected choice equals e dot target, and then selected answer. The way we get that is uh, selected choice, and then the data set, and then that uh, number property again. And the last thing we want to do in here is call get new question because that's where we after we've answered a question, then we want to go ahead and get the new one. So after I click here, um, what would you, which element does the script tag go in script? That one. So one thing I realized we forgot to do is notice I'm not getting any click action over here on the right. So uh, the reason is if we look in and inspect this, this text is not taking up the entire uh, width. So we actually wanna grab the game CSS 
grab the choice text and say width is gonna be 100% also. So now we can click on these. Now, so what's gonna happen is since we are calling get new question after we've uh, made a selection, it's going to load a new question. So you can see that kind of going through there. Then you get to a point where you get an error here and it says cannot read question of property. So what this is, is after we've used all of our questions, you can see that I've logged out that we have no questions left in the available questions array. So this is basically when the game is gonna be over. So we wanna check if available questions dot length is zero or the question counter greater than or equal to the max questions then we want to go to the end page and uh, to do that we can say window.location.assign and assign it to slash end.html now obviously we don't have the end html file yet that's what we'll do in one of the next videos uh, but this will go ahead and try to get it there so if there's no questions left in the array or if we've we've used uh, we've given the user all the questions that we want to so we could potentially have a question set of 100 but we only want to let them answer 10 if this question counter gets above that 10 the max questions then we'll go ahead and return as well so uh, if I save this one last time and then go ahead and click through yeah 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 this should try to go to an end HTML page which is exactly what we want so uh, that was a longer video that was a lot of good stuff I think we were able to load our questions from that array and then dynamically update the UI to reflect those new questions so in this next video we're gonna add some animations uh, for correctness when we answer our questions all right so in the last video we got it set up to uh, iterate through our questions and then we were able to detect uh, basically when the user has answered all the questions and then try to navigate to the end screen. So we're not gonna work on the end screen just yet. We're gonna add a new feature here uh, for animations on correct and incorrect answers. So we wanna want to basically uh, change the color here of the answer choice to red or green, more or less, and then uh, give a little pause before we switch to the next question. So the way we're gonna do this is one, based on whether or not they have the right answer, when they submit, uh, we want to uh, choose a class to apply. So the way this is gonna look is one, I can, let me use the selected answer in the log that we already have. And what I just wanna see, does selected answer equal our current question dot answer? And so let me save this and hopefully, actually let me remove any of these other log statements that we have as well. I think that's all of them, that one there. All right, so as I click on one of these, uh, does the, what's the correct syntax here, script source, so this should be true, which that says false. Uh, the alert should be true, so it's looking like it's not correct. So let's log out the selected answer and the current answer when we click. So one and three, it looked like for that one, the alert was four and four, so that should have been correct. And uh, where do we put the JavaScript in a script tag? So it should be one and one. So that looked right. So let me, let's do this one more time. I don't know what I was missing there. So, so where do we put the HTML script tag? So since uh, what we're pulling out of here is a string and the other one is a number, we can't use triple equals because that's a strict comparison that will actually compare the data type as well. If we use a double equals, that should give us what we're looking for. So where do we put the, or actually syntax for this uh, should be C. So that is true. If I do this one wrong, uh, we don't put it in a JS tag. That should be false. All right, so we're able to detect whether or not uh, the the answer was correct. So uh, basically, based on that, we want to figure out which class to apply. And we're going to have two different classes, a correct class and an incorrect class. So there's lots of different ways we could do this. I could start with a class to apply, and I could just have it be incorrect by default, and then say if, and then I could use this stuff. If it actually is correct, 
then I will just update class to apply to correct. So this is a, a pretty common technique uh, to go ahead and give a default value. So instead of, instead of me checking to see, does it equal this? If so, do this. If it doesn't equal this, then do something else. Uh, I can just set the default to incorrect, then check to see if it is correct and uh, go ahead and update that to correct. Now there's another way that we could do this is, and this is gonna throw an error because I've already got it defined, but I could say const class to apply and I could use the ternary operator where I could say selected answer equal equals current current question dot answer. And the way the ternary operator works is if this condition is true, then I will assign this value. If it's not, then I'll assign uh, this value. So this accomplishes the same thing. Uh, if you are comfortable with the syntax, it obviously is uh, just a one liner. It's wrapped because my uh, editor is short, uh, but it's a one liner versus uh, three or four lines here. So uh, I think this one is a little bit more readable. This one is, if you're comfortable with the ternary syntax, it's uh, just as useful. So uh, we've got the class to apply. Now we need to actually apply it. Let's just, uh, let's just log out class to apply just to be sure that that's right. And this is kind of my process here. As I go through, I'll make sure I log stuff out along the way to check to make sure things look right. So that should be correct. This one should be incorrect. Okay, so that looks like it's working. So now we wanna actually go ahead and apply this class. So we'll get our selected choice and we'll get the parent element. So what we're doing here is the, the selected choice is uh, this piece of text that we're clicking on, but we actually want this whole, the container element. So to get that, we'll grab the parent element and we'll say class list dot add. And this is how you apply classes in JavaScript and we'll add in the class to apply. So let's, uh, let me grab, let's see, let's grab this container. Let's click on it and notice that it applied this correct class here. So that's what we wanted. If we uh, do it again, this is an incorrect option. So it should give the incorrect class, but you'll notice that it actually keeps the uh, correct class as well. So what we want to do is uh, do the same exact thing except eventually we want to uh, remove the class because we just want the class to be there for just long enough to show the color and then move on. So the way we're gonna do this, and actually uh, let's, let's go ahead and do the CSS part of this first so we can just see what it looks like to add these classes. All right, so in of our, inside of our CSS, we're gonna add two classes. One is the correct, and it's just gonna be a background color. And it's gonna be a green color. Uh, this is actually, uh, I pulled this from the uh, bootstrap colors that they use for correctness. And uh, then the incorrect is gonna be the same kind of thing, but the background color, it's gonna be a red color, DC3545. Let's just, oh, four or five. Make sure that looks like a red color, there we go. So now uh, what we should see, since we've got the remove commented out, uh, as I click here, it's gonna add the class, but it won't remove it. So if I, uh, you see a green and red, and then this should be another red, and then we go to the end page. So what we want to do is remove that class after we're done, but uh, if we have these back to back, uh, it's going to apply the class, remove the class immediately, and it seems like nothing happens. So what we want to do is use a set timeout to give a little bit of delay uh, before we actually remove that class. So set timeout uh, is a function built into JavaScript that we will call, and it takes a callback function with uh, what you want to do and then it takes a parameter of how long you want to uh, be delayed. So inside of here, uh, we're gonna remove that class and then we're going to go ahead and get the new question as well. So we're gonna do all of that inside of this set timeout that is going to wait for a thousand milliseconds or uh, one second here. So let's see what this looks like. Let's save this, let us and this uh, auto reload just reloads a couple of times, so I'll give it a second here. Uh, so let's do a correct one, which script source should be correct, so that should show green. And then alert box is not a real thing, so that should show red. And notice it goes away and then it handles uh, every, everything pretty, uh, pretty well. So in the next video, what we're going to do is create our heads up display, which is gonna display uh, what question, what number, what question number we're on and then what the user score is. So we'll, we'll talk about tracking score there as well. So that's going to do it for this video and I'll see you in the next one.
All right, in our last video, we were able to add these pretty nifty uh, classes for correctness and incorrectness. And in this one, we're gonna work on our heads up display. So what a heads up display is, if you've never uh, heard of that term, it's basically just information about your game as you're playing. So the things that we care about in this one is uh, things like what number question you're on. So one of five, one of three, things like that. And then what your score is as well. And then usually your heads up display, your HUD, uh, kind of sits on top of, of your game. So it's usually at the top. So that's what we're going to do. So inside of our HTML, uh, inside of the game here, I'm going to add an ID of HUD, HUD. Inside of that, I'll have a HUD item. It will have a P tag with a class of HUD prefix. All right. And then, uh, then we'll have a, an H1 with a class of HUD main text. So what this is gonna break down to is up here, this first HUD item, it's gonna be a question. So which question are you on? And then this main text will show something like one of three. And this is something we're gonna have to update dynamically. And then I'm just gonna copy this whole thing here. And uh, we're gonna say this one is score and uh, this one will start out at three. Now we're gonna need to reference these things so we can uh, add IDs here, so not that, but ID equals score for this one. And then for the H1 above, the ID is gonna be question counter. All right, so we've got those things laid out. They obviously don't look very good. So uh, let's go ahead and style those and I can add a little section here for not JUD, but uh, HUD, our heads up display. And uh, as you might expect, uh, we're gonna take our HUD and we're gonna do a display uh, flex. This is going to, by default, oh, if I type in HUD, it'll work. So this is by default gonna put things uh, side by side, horizontally, which is what we want, but we also want to space them out a little bit. So uh, justify content is how you, uh, typically what we've done is use this as center. That's just gonna put everything in the center. But you, there's other options for putting spacing in between your items. So there is something called uh, space around, which will put space, it'll take the available space and it'll divide it but, uh, between here, here, and here. Uh, otherwise, we can do space between, which will put all of the open space in between these two elements and basically push them to the outside edges. And that's what we want. So that's what we're gonna do here. So we can just grab our HUD prefix and set text align center here and that ought to line up the uh, question and score text. Now, this text is looking really small, and I think I'm missing some P styling. So I'm just gonna add a uh, font size here is going to be to rim, which is more or less uh, 20 pixels. So that looks a little bit better, I think, here. Uh, and then also, uh, looks like I could style the the HUD main text, I think is what it is, HUD main text, and just align that center as well to make sure those line up. So I think this looks pretty good for the display of the HUD. Now we need to be able to dynamically update it. So to do that, we need to get a reference in our JavaScript here uh, to the HUD, or what's the IDs that I used here? I think it's question counter and question counter and the score. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my snippet get ID and the first one's gonna be question counter, counter. And then the second one is get ID is, uh, not question counter, but score. So notice also that we've already used those variables. So I'm gonna update these to be text. So the, uh, the actual text element that we're updating is gonna be question counter text the actual score element that we're going to be updating is uh, score text. So the first thing we want to do is let's grab our HTML. Let's get rid of the one of three here. Let's just hide that for now. And uh, so, so that we can do that part uh, dynamically. So after we update our question counter, let's go and update the uh, question counter text to reflect that. So this will be question counter uh, text and then we want to set the inner text and we want to set it to uh, two different things uh, question so question oh actually this should be a variable 
question counter plus a slash and then uh, the max questions because we want to show them what number of question they're on out of how many. So this is one way to do that. Uh, notice that uh, that updates appropriately. This is just uh, using string concatenation, but there's a, a better way to do this with ES6 template literals, where if you use the, um, the single back quote ticks uh, and put all of your stuff inside of that, you can reference variable names directly inside of that string. So if I uh, use the dollar sign and then in brackets put that variable, I can get rid of these quotes and I can just type in directly what I want while interpolating uh, variables. So this should give us the same effect here and it should update as I click on one of these, it should update to question two of three and three of three, which is pretty cool. So uh, in that same vein, we wanna do something very similar using our score. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to check whether or not the user got the answer right, and then we're going to incre increment the score. So I'm gonna create an increment uh, score function, which takes in a number and it uh, increments the score, as you might expect, and then it updates the score text. So score text dot enter text equals uh, the new score. All right, so we've got this function, but now we need to call it. So what we'll do is we'll say if class to apply equals correct, then we'll call increment score and we'll tell it to increment the score by the uh, correct bonus. All right, so let's see what we got here when we do this. Uh, the first one should be a source. See if that increments to 10, that's good. The, uh, where do we put JavaScript? It goes to uh, script tag, that looks good. And then I should uh, fail this one. Actually, I just gotta reload, sorry. Uh, so let's just double check that something here doesn't increment the score. So if it doesn't equal correct, it doesn't increment the score. All right, so that looks pretty good. We're keeping track of our score. We're able to display what question we're on. Now the next thing we wanna do in the next video is we're gonna update this, uh, this little two of three text, one of three, two of three, things like that. And we want to create a progress bar to kind of show the progress to the user in a more visual way as they go through. So I think this will be a, a cool exercise to make this a little bit fancier. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video and I will see you there. All right guys, so in the last video, we got our, our HUD, our heads up display uh, to work. It looks pretty good, but I think we can make it look a little bit cooler. So right now, uh, under question, it just shows like one of three here, but uh, it's a little bit neater, a little bit uh, more fun to have a progress bar so you can kind of see your percentage as you go through. So that's what we're gonna do in this video. And just so you can see what it looks like, uh, it's gonna look something like this. So we're gonna have our question, uh, we're actually gonna show one of five up here and then have the progress bar just kind of fill up as you go through and answer questions. So it'll kind of fill up there. So that's what we're gonna do. And the way this works is we're gonna have an outside div, which is this kind of empty rectangle. And then we'll have a div that sits right on top of it and just kind of gets bigger and bigger based on the percentage of question that you're on. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's go ahead and dive in and do it. So inside of our game HTML, we're going to change out this Let's see, we're gonna change out the H1 here, which uh, used to be the question counter text. We're going to update uh, this P tag up top to say, uh, to give it an ID of progress. Ah, I don't know why that import is doing that. ID of progress text. So that's gonna be the, the word question. And then we're actually gonna uh, show the, the number combination there. But then after that, we want to have a Div with an ID of progress bar. Inside of progress bar, we'll have a something with a class of progress bar full. Now this inner div is basically gonna be the thing that shows how far, how much progress we've made. So it's gonna show how full this bar is. So we've got this in our HTML. What's, what error are we getting here? Look at our console, inner text. Okay, so since we've gotten rid of uh, in here, we're setting the inner text of, where is that? Of our question counter text. This is now going to be our progress text. So we just want to update that. So this one is gonna be progress text. 
and we're going to get it by the progress text ID. And down here, we don't want to reference question counter text. We want to reference progress text. So you can see that works. We're actually going to add on a question here too, just so it's kind of obvious what it is. So let's just say question one of three, and this will update the same way that it used to. Question two of three here, and so on and so on. But now we need to actually style our progress bar. So let's open up uh, the CSS file. And we'll start by working with the uh, progress bar. So we'll grab the progress bar uh, by the ID. And we'll say width is going to be 20 rem, and then height is going to be 4 rem. So it's going to be 200 pixels by 40 pixels high. You don't really see anything yet, so let's do a border of 0 0.3 rem solid and then we'll use our blue color uh, which is 56A5EB. So now we should see this kind of laid out here. That's our that's our top box, right? That's our original box. And uh, now we want to uh, work on the inner bar. So let's get our progress bar full. And actually this could probably be let's grab let's do this by ID as well. So let's change this to an ID and go in our HTML and change that there as well. So progress bar full and make this an ID instead of a class. So our progress bar full, uh, let's say the height is gonna be 3.4 rem. The background color is going to match uh, the background or the border color of the, uh, of the container of the parent of the progress bar itself. All right, so you can see by default, the inner div, the progress bar full, went ahead and filled up the uh, progress bar parent uh, div. And so the way we're going to do our percentages to show progress is just to set the width property. It's actually pretty simple. So if I set this to 50%, this fills up 50% of the bar, which is pretty good. So that's what we're going to work with. Uh, let's go into, let's start, this is going to need to start at 0%. So we'll do that. And then let's go into our JavaScript and we'll want to get a reference to our progress bar full all right so we've got we got the inner item and basically every time we increment our question now we want to uh, update the progress bar and again the the way we're going to do that is just just by setting the uh, width property on that progress bar super simple pretty straightforward uh, but actually has a pretty cool effect so what we're going to do is uh, grab the progress bar full. We will do uh, style and then uh, do width. So style is how you can change basically any of your CSS properties. And what we'll do in here is uh, basically, actually before we do that, let's just uh, log out so I can show you what we're going to do. Uh, question counter divided by max questions. Okay, so let's look at the console here. So to start off, this will print out 0 0.333. Uh, when we go to the next one, it'll be 0 0.6666. So what we actually want to do is take this, this whole thing that we just did. Did I close it out instead? Take this whole thing that we just did and then multiply it times 100 to get a percent. If I add another parenthesis. All right, so that's gonna give us 33.333%. And uh, we can take this whole thing, and let's get rid of the log, and we can set the width property to, to that number. So what this is gonna do, is gonna take question counter, which starts out at one. Uh, it's going to divide by the max number of questions, which is three in this case. So one divided by three is 0.333, and then multiply times 100. So if I save this, uh, we might expect to see this updating here, let's see, uh, we might ex expect to see the updating, but it's not quite. So what's going on is uh, this actually needs to be a value in pixels. So we can do our uh, back ticks like this, and we can say that we want to evaluate this expression. So that whole thing, so question counter divided by max questions times 100, we can evaluate that whole thing and then add on uh, pixels at the end and we are missing looks like I need to move this uh, this parenthesis inside 
So I think that's going to do it. So we should see when we start off, we'll see a third. It looks like a little bit less than a third. All right, it looks like there's something we're missing here. So let's grab the progress bar full. It's saying, oh, this is <laughs> not pixels. We actually want this to be percent. So instead of pixels, this will be percent. And then now uh, that should look like a third. This should look like two thirds and this should look like three thirds. So this gives a pretty obvious way for the user to see that they are on their, on their last question, on their first question, so on and so on. One thing I don't like here is I think there should be a little bit of padding at the top of our progress bar or margin. So let's do a margin top and we'll do this uh, one rim, 10 pixels, push that down just a little bit and maybe is that line up now with our score? Maybe we could do 1.5 push it down a little bit more. Let's go all the way to two rims. So now I think these look a little bit, a little bit better together. Actually, I think 1.5 looked best. <laughs> so uh, we've got our progress bar working, which is pretty sweet. Uh, in the next video, we're actually going to go ahead and create our end screen where we're going to have to save the user's score save it into local storage. So we're gonna work with local storage and we're gonna work with arrays in local storage and then figure out an algorithm of whether or not their high score actually makes the top five list. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video. Hope you guys are enjoying it and I'll see you there. What's up guys? Uh, in the last video, we worked on uh, improving our heads up display by adding this progress bar, which I think is pretty sweet. So in this video, we're now going to uh, create our end screen. So we need an end HTML and we need an end JavaScript file. So in our end HTML, uh, obviously uh, we'll stub out HTML5 boilerplate. We'll say congrats is the title. And we've done this in the past two pages. So I'm just gonna kind of copy this in here as well. Inside of the body, we're going to uh, have a container and then we're gonna have the page is gonna be ID of end here and then flex center, flex column. So let's uh, let's navigate. Actually, let's first put something in there. Hey, or hello, whatever. And uh, after we answer all of our questions, so one, two, and three, this should now take us to a working uh, hello page here, or excuse me, end page. And we want to include the CSS, app CSS, so that this looks a little bit better. There we go. And uh, what do we need now? We'll need a reference to our uh, script tag. So script source equals app, or excuse me, in JS. And I think we're ready to go. So let's start by stubbing out uh, what all is gonna be inside of this end HTML page. And we're gonna start with an H1 here uh, that has an ID of final score. And it's gonna be blank to start, or we can just set it at zero for display purposes. And then we're gonna have a form. So what this is, is for the user to submit their uh, their their score if they want to. So we don't need an action here because we're gonna handle that ourselves. And we're gonna have an input of type text and it's gonna have a name of username, an ID of username as well, and then a place holder of username. All right, so we should see a little tiny form there we're actually, we're gonna have to make this work a little bit better later on, so we will. Uh, then we'll have a button with a type of submit. And we're gonna give this a class of button. So since we already have that class uh, that we used before, this is gonna go ahead and, and style up pretty pretty nice. Once we say, uh, give this a save text, it should look like what we expect, All right? So it looks pretty good, all right? And a few other things we need in here. Uh, this is, an, uh, we need an ID. ID because this is the save score button that we're gonna need to get a reference to. Uh, then on click, we're gonna set the on click handler in side of the HTML. And it's gonna call a function called save high score and pass in the event. All right, and this will, I think this will just give us an error for now since we don't have that defined. That function defined, yeah. So it threw an error real quick and then it went ahead and navigated to this, which is what forms do by default. So we'll talk about that in a second. Oops. All right, so that's our form. And then we're gonna have two uh, anchor tag buttons to uh, one to play the, the game again, and then another one to go home. 
So these are just anchor tags with a class of button and then uh, they tell it, tell it where to go basically. So this is gonna line up pretty well I think here. And so the only thing we're missing is styling this, uh, this input here. Now I could create in uh, a CSS file for the end screen, but I'm just gonna use our app CSS because these are not really specific uh, to, um, to the end screen. This is things that would uh, be used on any screen that needed a form basically. So that's why we're gonna keep it inside of the app CSS. So let's open that up and what I want to do is grab a any form and say width is gonna be 100% which is fine. Uh, this is gonna be a display flex uh, and then uh, set the flex direction to column. So this is gonna stack everything on top of each other which is what I want and then set the flex Oh, excuse me, uh, set the align items to center. So this is gonna center everything. Now we need to uh, style the input form. So we're gonna grab input and we'll say, give it a little margin bottom, give a little space there. We'll say, let's see, width is gonna be 20 rem. So this should match the width of the buttons. The padding is gonna be 1.5 rem. Give it some space there. All right, starting to look, look a little bit better. Font size is gonna be 1.8 rem to match the size of the buttons as well. The border, we're actually gonna take the border away. So we're gonna say border none, and then we'll do a box shadow of 0, 0.0, or excuse me, 0, 0 0.1 rem, 1.4 rem, 0, and then RGBA 86, 185, 235 and 0 0.5 as the opacity. So we've seen that before as well. So this is gonna give a little bit of box shadow around here. That looks a little bit different than what I thought this should look like. Let's compare it to here. So let's uh, get through to the end screen. Oh, uh, this should be 0 0.5 for the opacity there. That looks better. So that looks pretty good. Um, I don't like how dark that placeholder text is. So I'm gonna style that. So you can grab that by doing input and then a double colon placeholder. And I just wanna change it to a lighter color. So I'm gonna use um, AAA, which will be a, a pretty light gray there to kind of take, take, some of the, take, some of that, uh, take some of that away. So what we're also gonna do now with our, our button, we've got a button disabled stuff here. So notice as uh, hover on here, uh, save is uh, hovering and it, let, it makes you think that you can click on it, but we shouldn't let the user click until there's something in the text. So I'm gonna start, or actually let's do, let's do two things. Let's go ahead and move over to our end screen and then we'll talk about the dis disabledness. So let's grab, or actually, sorry, I'm kind of stumbling around here. We've already said save high score is gonna be a function. Uh, let's go ahead and define that just so we can kind of see uh, what happens when a user clicks. So we're gonna get the event E and I can console log here, uh, clicked the save button. And so let's save this, let's refresh, let's click save, and you'll probably see something a little weird. Uh, save, you saw that log pop up here maybe for a second and then it goes away. So forms by default will go ahead and submit to a new page with those uh, form properties in, uh, in the, as query parameters at the top. So what we wanna do is we wanna do e.prevent, prevent default. So this will prevent the form from taking its default action, which is to then post to a different page. So clicking save now should be okay. It'll just log out and then I can click this as many times as I want. All right, so uh, this is letting me click, but I don't want to be able to click unless, the, unless somebody has typed in here. So what I'll do is in our end HTML, I'll come down to our button and I'll set it, by dis set it to disabled by default. All right, so now I can't click on it and it notice that uh, not click allowed hover state, which is nice. Inside of our JavaScript now, I wanna get a reference to the uh, input text, so the username text. So get ID uh, username, that'll give me a reference to it. And then I want to add an event listener for key up. And you might try uh, doing change. Change as an event listener for uh, inputs doesn't, probably do exactly what you expect. Uh, it really only uh, triggers when you 
kind of navigate into and away from your input. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a change on every uh, character that you type in, for example. So that's where key up comes in. So just as a test, uh, we can log out every time we key up. Let's do username input dot value. All right, so this should, oh, let me, oh, semicolons go at the end of a line. Save that. And as we type here, now we should see, oh, nope, username input. Oh, just username, I think is what I went with. So username right there. And if I start typing, we should see it pop up over here, which is good. So now we can decide whether or not to uh, disable the save score button based on the input that's in here. So let's get the uh, save score button. Let's see what we called it. Uh, save score button is what we called it. Save score button. All right. And we're gonna say save score button disabled, not dispatch, disabled equals, and we're gonna disable it if there's no username input or username value. If there's no, if there's nothing typed in there, if it's uh, uh, falsy, and falsy could be empty string, undefined, uh, things like that. So if there's nothing in there, then set the button to disabled. If there is something there, then that will disable, or excuse me, enable the button for us to submit. So we should see, to start off, this is disabled, that's good. We come in here and type, and now this is enabled, and we can click on it to save, which is great. So we're gonna need to do a couple of things in here. One is in the in the game HTML, or excuse me, game JS, when we end the game, we want to save off the high the the player score so that we can access it in the end screen. So what this is gonna look like is we'll use local storage and we're gonna set an item. And we're just gonna set this uh, with a key of most recent score. And we're gonna save score into that value. All right, so that works. And then in our end screen, now we want to get, uh, when we load up, we wanna get that score. So uh, we'll, we'll say const most recent score equals local storage get item so we want to get something out of local storage and we want to get uh, the most recent score and then we want to update uh, the score text so the score text is in our end HTML the final score so let's get a reference to that with get ID get ID final score and we can say final score enter text equals most recent score all right so right now by default let's actually let's uh, get rid of the zero by default and come over to our end screen so the way you can look at local storage is if you come into your Chrome developer tools you can open up the application tab look at local storage and uh, I've already got some of this stuff saved from the past but if I change this to 10 as my most recent score, and let's actually, let me get rid of a couple of these things so that uh, we'll kind of be starting from scratch. If I set most recent score to 10 and refresh, it's going to pull 10 from the recent score. Now you can come in and you can uh, add this key value pair yourself, or what we should do is come in to our game page and let's play the game real quick. So let's get a higher score than 10. So script source, I think is right, so that's 10 then where do we put uh, JavaScript is in a script tag, so that's 20. And then uh, let's do an alert. So this should give us a score of 30 in here. Notice that updated, and then it pulled it in our end screen right here, which is pretty sweet. So that's gonna do it uh, for this video. We're gonna kind of split this topic in two. So right now we're able to uh, get the high score from the game, we're able to display it, and we're able to handle when a user clicks on the save button. Now in the next video, we'll take a few minutes to work with saving the high scores in local storage uh, and determining whether or not the score is valid for a high score, whether or not it's high enough. And then later on, we'll do the high score sc screen to pull those scores out. So that's gonna do it for this video and uh, we'll finish up handling the score stuff in the next one. Okay, so uh, we've got our end screen where it's able to load the user score. 
we've got the disabling and enabling of the save button based on having input in there. So that's now it's enabled. Now we need to actually figure out how to save uh, high scores into uh, an array of high scores into uh, local storage. So the first thing we want to do is, or first thing I think you need to understand is that uh, local storage only uses key value pairs with the value being a string. So anything that you store in there is going to be a string. So if I tried to, if I tried to set local storage set item, if I tried to set high scores to an empty array, it's not going to like that. Uh, so you can see, I don't know if I'll get an error or not, but notice high scores doesn't actually have anything in there. And if I do a, if I console log, uh, the opposite of this local storage get item high scores, I, I guess what it will do is just show me an empty string. Yeah, it looks like it's just showing me an empty string. So uh, it's just important for you to understand that things in local storage are stored as a string. So we can actually still work with arrays. We just need to convert them into a JSON string before we do. So if I wanted to uh, to convert uh, an array or anything to uh, JSON, I could do JSON stringify. And if I do this, notice that uh, this becomes a string in here. So it's saved as a string that looks like an empty array. And in the console, I should get an empty array back. Now, this is still a string though. So this, that's, this thing that's coming out of here is a string. So to convert that into an actual array, you could do uh, json.parse. So this is what we're gonna use is uh, json parse and json stringify. So now if you look at uh, the console log, we're actually getting an array object out of local storage, so pretty cool. So the first thing we want to do is get a reference to our high score, so const high scores. And this is, I'm gonna change this a little bit. This is actually gonna be the get item. And we want to get the high scores, but remember we need to do the parsing. So JSON parse, all right. And then let's just uh, log this to be sure so that we can get a reference to all of these things. All right, so this is actually uh, printing this out if we didn't have anything in local storage. So you're running this application for the first time. If I got rid of this key value pair and ran this again, you'll see what actually happens in the console. It returns null, right? Because there's no item in here called high scores. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna get what's in local storage, or if that returns null, we're just gonna get an empty array because we're doing it for the first time. This will go ahead and initialize our empty high scores array, all right? So we've got, a, got an array of high scores here. Now what we're gonna do inside of our high score is we're going to uh, create a score object that has a score. Um, so it's actually gonna reference the most, uh, most recent, gosh, most recent score. All right, and then it's also gonna have a name which we're gonna get from the username value. All right, so let's log score so you can see what this looks like. Okay, so let's type in uh, James Q quick, let's save. And we should see now this is the object getting printed out. So this is what we wanna actually add to our array. So we will say high scores dot push and we'll push on this new score. And then let's log the high scores array. Okay, so let's uh, type in a name here, James quick, save. Uh, inside of here, you'll see that. If I change it to Jess, for example, save again. Now we have two things in here for high scores. And that's fine. So now typically what would happen is you would save your score and then get navigated away uh, to basically back to the home page. But the one thing we're missing here is we don't necessarily know that this score is gonna make the, the list, the top, and we're, we're just gonna save the top five scores. So we don't necessarily know that uh, that the score is automatically high enough to make it onto that list. So what we're gonna do is we're going to basically add our score to the list, then we're gonna sort our list, then we're going to cut off anything greater than five. So if we have five items and we add on another one, we will sort it and then cut off the last one because we're gonna sort based on 
uh, decreasing score. So the highest score is going to be first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Anything uh, below that is going to just be cut off. So I actually spent a lot of time kind of fumbling around and figuring out how to do this and then came up with a, a really pretty simple example uh, or a pretty simple way to do it that I will share with you now. So by default, we're going to go ahead and push on this new score. Then we're going to call high scores dot sort. And this is a uh, function uh, built in JavaScript for arrays where you can define your own um, sortation algorithm. And what you're what you're trying to do is you're returning uh, either less than zero or greater than zero. So for us to uh, for us to sort these in highest to lowest, we want to take the B score, which is the second uh, parameter that we have, and subtract the A score. So this is basically saying if the B score is higher than the A score, then put B before A. Uh, so if you've seen these kind of functions with um, with arrays and using arrow functions, you might also know that there's an implicit return. So you don't actually have to have the return and you, then you don't have to have the brackets and you don't have to have the semicolon. So all in one line, we can sort this array uh, by uh, doing this line here and it's gonna sort it by score. So that will give us uh, a sorted array which might have more than five, which might have more than five scores. So let's create a variable. So uh, we'll call this max high and set it equal to five. So now we want to take our high scores array and we want to splice at the uh, fifth index. So this is basically saying at index five, start cutting off everything after that. So uh, let's, let's see what we got here. Let's say we have James. We have Hess, <laughs> we have Jess, we have Jessica, we have Lily, and now we've got five. So what should happen is if I try to add Sevi, it will cut off uh, the last one. It'll cut off that Sevi, and uh, it'll keep the maximum amount of scores at five, which is great. Now, the only thing we're not able to check yet is whether or not the the scores are actually being done in order. So let's, uh, instead of just grabbing the most recent score, let's do a math.random and multiply that by 100. So this should give us a, and we can floor this to get an integer math.floor. All right, so let's, let's save this, let's try again. So let's start with uh, James gets a score of what, 82, that's not bad, Jess gets a score of uh, 38, which is not as good. Lily gets a score of uh, 39. So notice these are now in order, which is good. Uh, Sevi gets a score of 45. So notice they're still in order. And then uh, Padfoot, and these are my dogs that I'm, I'm running through here. Will, uh, Padfoot is right here at 40. Now, if we try to add another one, let's say I play again and I do James again and save now we should have kicked out somebody so either looks like my score would have been whatever the lowest one was <laughs> so my name got kicked out if i tried this again i might get a higher score than jess and now jess would be bumped out and i moved up to here with 42. so that high score system is working and it actually uh, becomes pretty simple so basically the the idea here is you you go ahead and add the score to your array you sort it and then you splice out any of the extra ones now the last thing we need to do well the two things is we need to update our local storage. So local storage set item, we need to update the high scores and we want to uh, update it with our high scores. But remember we need to uh, stringify this uh, into JSON so that it can be saved as a string in the high scores. So we'll save that. Uh, let's go ahead and get a couple of scores into our high scores, just so you guys can see this. So let's say James, uh, gets whatever score, what is that, 93, that's pretty good. Uh, let's refresh and notice now that uh, when I get the high scores originally, it includes my score. So that's actually permanently, permanently being saved. Now I can add Jess and do a refresh. I, just, I should see, again, Jess is pretty bad and I'm pretty good. <laughs> uh, 93 and 30, so those are being persistent. Now the, the very last thing we'll do here is uh, when we get done with this, we want to uh, window, location, assign, and we just want to go back home. So let's go to uh, slash 
Or actually, I think we can just do slash maybe. All right. So we have, and I can get rid of, clean this up a little bit by getting rid of this console log and this console log. And so let's say James, oops, James, save the score and go back home. So the next step here, let me double check my notes here. The next step is to actually create the high score page, which will load those high scores out of there. So that's gonna do it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. All right, so we are uh, making a lot of progress with our game. We're able to save our high scores. Now we just need to be able to display them to the user. So we're gonna create our high scores HTML, and we're also gonna need a high scores JavaScript. All right, so in our HTML, we'll start off with our boilerplate. We'll call this uh, high scores. We will reference the link uh, for our app CSS. We don't need any specific stylings for high, or actually we do have just a bit. So we'll add uh, another one for high score CSS and I'll add that file here. All right, so there's, uh, I think we've got, oh, just one more thing, our script. We'll need to include a script to high scores JavaScript. All right, and then inside of our body, we'll do, uh, I'm just gonna copy these again. And actually, I'm just gonna copy this because we've done we've done enough typing out HTML. So uh, we've got our standard uh, container and then our high scores uh, page basically inside of it with uh, flex center and flex column. So what we've got is an H1 that says high scores. Then we've got a UL called high scores list and then a button to go home. So let's navigate over to high scores. And uh, notice we've got the, the UL, the unordered list in here somewhere, but there's nothing in it. And that's what, uh, that's what JavaScript is gonna do for us is we're gonna use JavaScript to populate that list. So uh, this is actually gonna be fairly simple inside of high scores JS. Uh, one, we wanna get a reference to our high scores list. So uh, high scores list is gonna be like that. And let me close close the, uh, the project explorer. And uh, then we want to get the high scores out of local storage. So const high scores equals, and this is gonna be exactly what we did before. So we're going to uh, JSON parse the local storage get item high scores. Uh, and if that doesn't work, if that doesn't return anything, we'll say or empty array. All right, so that way nothing breaks. So let's, uh, let's log this just so we can see that it's there. See that we're getting something back, so high scores in the console, All right? It should be James, James, and Jess. I'm definitely winning in the numbers there. So that's working. And then we want to, we want to go through and iterate through each score. And for each one of those scores, we want to add an LI to our unordered list. Now this is the this is the exact uh, use case for uh, map, so uh, high scores, which is an array map, will get a reference to each high score, and actually just to shorten this up, I'll call it score. And uh, basically in here we can do something with each of these, which each of these scores. So let me just. Uh, let me just do a couple of logs in here so you guys can see. We're gonna get a reference to each one of these. Each one is an object. And what we want to do is we want to uh, create an LI that uh, has both the username and the username and the score inside of it. So let's do uh, template literal and let's grab the score dot username and then we'll do a dash and then do score dot score. So let's log that. Now we should see uh, username, is that not what I did? Or name, I think is what I did. All right, so there we go. So you'll see the scores here. Uh, we also, we want these to not just be strings, we want these to actually be uh, LIs. So we can create um, in JavaScript, just say, hey, we're gonna create an LI that has that stuff as its content, and then we'll close out the LI. So save this, now we should see there's li li. And uh, we can also add a class here. So class, so we can just type this in here. So basically we're writing HTML inside of our, uh, inside of our JavaScript. So uh, save this and we'll see that the li's are being printed out. 
Now this uh, this is printing out each li. This is printing out each li uh, total. So what I want to show you with map is I'm going to return this thing, this string for each one of those items, and then console log what the actual output of this whole thing is, which I think is pretty sweet. So when I when I output this thing totally, uh, notice that it's an array of strings. So what map does is it takes an incoming array, which is high scores, and allows you con to convert each of those items to something new in the new array. So we're taking in the score object and we're returning back a string version of an LI that has the stuff in it that we need, which is pretty, pretty sweet. Now you can also take, uh, since this is an array, you can take a join and join all of those elements in the array, join it with an empty string. And so now I do oh, no semicolon. Uh, now I'm actually getting a string with all of my LI content in here. And you may or may not know where we're going here, but what we're going to do is we're going to say high scores list, which is an unordered list. And we're going to set the enter actually not set, but enter HTML to this uh, joined, this mapped joined string, <laughs> if that makes sense. So we save this and refresh. Now we should see these scores are popping up, which is pretty cool, I think. So the only thing left here uh, is to style it. And before we do that, I just want to kind of make sure that you guys, if you're not familiar with map, you spend a little time with this. Uh, just the basic understanding is you take an array of items and you're converting each of those items into something else. Uh, for the most part, once you do it a few times, you'll get used to it. Also notice if you guys have done any React, this is almost exactly how React works where you're, you're creating JSX, which is really just HTML and a string in JavaScript. And then you're, uh, you're using that to put it on the screen basically. So that's what we're doing here. And this technique uh, with using map and then returning turning outputted strings, uh, out, outputted HTML strings uh, is pretty common in React too. So uh, last thing we wanna do is just grab our high scores CSS and we will say our high scores list. We'll say list style is none. So let's save that, that'll get rid of the bullet points if I typed it in right, I think. High scores, I spell that right? Nope, capital L. High scores list, that'll get rid of the bullet points. Uh, by default, the items in there have padding to the left because of those bullet points or they actually just indent them a bit. So let's do padding left is zero and just line them up on uh, with no padding on the left. And we'll say margin bottom is four rem just to space it out from the go home button, give a little space. And then for each one of our high score, set the font size to 2.8 rem. All right, we'll say margin bottom for each one of those is gonna be 0 0.5 rem. And last thing we'll do, uh, just a small effect is just add a hover effect. And we'll do a transform of the score to scale it up to, uh, let's say 1.025. Uh, so this will just make it a little bit bigger uh, if we get all right done reloading just make it a little bit bigger as we go through so we got our high scores we can also um, I think I'm missing a little bit in here we can add where's our JavaScript file add just a, a space in here to make that look a little bit cleaner there we go so we're able to save our high scores we're able to load them in our high score screen uh, from local storage which is pretty sweet and then we're able actually able to go back home and kind of navigate through our application now, one extra thing to note, local storage is not secure. As you saw, I could come in to local storage and I could say my most recent score is duh, whatever this really big number is. And you may have seen people do that where they kind of hack games like that in the past. Uh, this is not secure. This is just for demo purposes. If you really wanted to do this, you would save it in a database somewhere where no one else could go in and just kind of change what they're saving. But I think we're making a lot of progress. This is really, really cool. Uh, we've got a few more videos coming up. Uh, in the next one, we're going to load our questions from a JSON file instead of from an API, or excuse me, instead of from a static array. Then we're going to actually use a, a public API to load uh, open DB API questions from. Then we're going to add a loader, and then we're going to wrap up. So that's going to do it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.
Okay, so we've got, uh, honestly, the majority of our game stuff working, uh, but we're going to make a few improvements before we get done with, uh, with this course. And the first thing we're going to do is instead of hard coding uh, this array of questions in here, we're going to actually uh, put them in a JSON file. So we're going to open up a file called questions.json, and we will take the questions in here. And actually... I'm going to copy and paste it in there because a little bit of formatting you have to do. So inside of questions.json file, uh, you'll have your array, and then it, it looks almost exactly the same except for these keys and the key value pairs need to be in quotes also. So if you do a copy and paste into this questions.json file, you'll need to make sure that your uh, keys are in quotes. If you don't, it'll give you errors in VS Code. Uh, so make sure those are set that way. Uh, otherwise, you can just grab them from the course content and just copy this file into your um, into your application. So uh, instead of getting our questions this way, we're going to get rid of that hard coded set of questions, and we're going to use the fetch API to go out and fetch these questions. So the way this is going to look is we're going to start with an empty array of questions. We're going to uh, use the fetch function, uh, and we're going to uh, fetch questions.json. So in the next video, we're actually going to use fetch to pull questions from an API. Uh, this is uh, pulling from a local file, but it works the exact same way. So we're going to fetch questions from there. Uh, this returns a promise. So then we can call uh, a dot then, and we're going to get a response in the dot then. Now the response that it returns is not probably not exactly what you would expect. So let's, uh, I'm going to log this out and we'll come over to play play here and open up our console and I don't know why that oh <laughs> I do know why so uh, that just skipped right over our uh, application because we have an empty array of questions and as you know when we run out of questions it uh, goes to the end screen so we'll come back to that uh, but we can I can leave my logs how do I do this preserve log and then go to play again now, uh, even though it navigated away, it can show me um, what it logged out. So this is basically like an HTTP response. And really what we want out of that is a JSON version of the data. So inside of a promise, you can return a promise. So response, or excuse, this should actually be just res. So res.json will get the, out of this HTTP response, it'll get the body and convert it uh, into JSON. And so we can return that inside of this reform, inside of this promise. And because of that, then we can uh, do a dot then on that. And we can say, this is the loaded questions. And then I can console log loaded questions. And this should be the actual uh, JSON part that we want. So let's uh, do play again. And see, in promise loaded questions is not defined. Uh, loaded questions typing is one of the most important things you can do as a programmer so let's go uh, play again and we should see our questions are actually being loaded I'm not gonna show them to me from that array which is fine so from here uh, what I want to happen is instead of calling start game immediately I want to wait to call start game until I've got my questions back so I'll call start game there and I'll say my questions I'll get from the questions that I just loaded. All right, so if I save this, we should be able to go back to play again, see our questions are being loaded here, and uh, be able to answer and play our game just like we thought. So let's uh, just finish out. We'll get a score of zero. Because of that, we might want to play again. Now, one thing to notice is, and we'll fix this uh, in a couple videos from now, is when we load this screen, you see that dummy text pop up before you see your actual, um, before you see your actual real question being prompted. So eventually, we're going to add a loader to help uh, make that look a little bit better. But for now, this is what we're going to do. So uh, just best practice here: when you do a uh, make a request uh, with fetch and with other things that return promises, you also want to handle the catch, which is the error scenario. So in uh, here, if I was to type in the wrong path to the file, it's gonna trigger this error and I could error out that error message to the console. So if I look at my console, this is gonna say, 
Um, unexpe unexpected token. Uh, so it failed to parse JSON because that's not real JSON because that's not a real file. And it threw an error and then I just logged it out uh, to the console. So this is typically something you'll want to do. I'm not gonna, we don't really have any fancy error cases here. You might flash up a message that says like fail to load questions, go back to the home screen and try again. Or you might give the user a button to try to refresh the questions or something like that. It doesn't really matter. But just know in general, when you make these type of requests or make anything that returns a promise, you want to handle that catch case too. So that if something goes wrong, you know what to do. Uh, but with this being typed in correctly, it should work just as we expect. All right, so it looks really good. So I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, I just wanted to kind of show you guys, uh, one, get a primer for fetch and then show you uh, it's a little bit cleaner to save those, uh, those questions inside of another file instead of inside of this file. And then uh, go ahead and pull it in with fetch. So in the next one, we're actually gonna use the Open Trivia DB, Open Trivia DB API, which gives us a public way to get questions that people have already submitted. And it's got uh, 3,200 verified questions. And we can go and grab those so that we don't have to write our own and uh, we can use those for our users. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video. I'm excited about it. I hope you guys are too, and I'll see you there. All right, guys, so in the last video, we uh, worked on fetching our questions from a questions.json file. So using the fetch API here, uh, we put our questions in a JSON file, and then we uh, basically called to get those questions from that file. So what we're gonna do now is instead, we're gonna use a, an API called the Open Trivia Database, and this API lets you uh, make a remote API call to get a list of questions. So if you look at their API here, they've got, uh, got a couple of different uh, properties that you can set on your query. So number of questions, we'll do 10. Uh, we'll do general knowledge as a category. We'll do easy as a difficulty. We'll do multiple choice. And then uh, we can leave a default encoding. So we can generate the... API URL and what this does we can copy this and open this in the browser and uh, What we'll get back is a list of questions. So you can see here uh, It's got two properties one is the response code and then the results and the results is with the actual data in it So you can see this is an array of questions each question has a category uh, a type uh, difficulty the question the correct answer and then incorrect answers so you'll notice that this, uh, the format of how they store these questions are a little bit different than what we've been doing so far. So what we're gonna do is we're going to query these questions or fetch these questions using the fetch API. So we're gonna paste in this URL here. So we're gonna paste it right into there. And let's get rid of the file explorer. Uh, and then instead of uh, doing all of this stuff, I'm going to log out what the loaded questions are. So let's uh, refresh this. So got our live server running and let me, I think that's right. So uh, there's our data that we get back from this API. Obviously this is super, super easy. This is the benefit of, of things like public APIs. Uh, if I wanted to log out just the results, uh, results or result, results. So do that, then I should see that array of questions right there. So what we need to do is transform each of these questions into something, into the format basically that we work with uh, in our app. So the way we're gonna do this is, uh, if you think about what we just said, we want to uh, convert the questions that we get into a new form. So we can use a map. So this is iterating through an array and then transforming each item in that array into something else. So we're going to uh, do our loaded questions results dot map and inside of here we'll get each individual loaded question and then we need to figure out how to transform it so what I want to start with is I'm going to create a formatted question and it's going to be an object with a question property and it's coming from the loaded question and this should actually be singular up here so loaded question uh, dot question so the formatted question, this thing right here, that's what we're gonna return out of this map. So every time we map through, we're gonna get the original question, we're gonna format that question into the format that we need and return that, and then we'll have the, the, the array of questions in the right format that we need. So we need to start building this up. So what I want to do is I wanna get the answer choices, and I wanna use the uh, spread operator from loaded 
question dot incorrect answers. All right, so this is gonna give us uh, basically an array. We're gonna copy that array of what the three uh, answer choices are. These are the incorrect ones. And what I originally, or what I eventually need is four answer choices and then the answer for <laughs> the answer, the correct answer in a random position, either A, B, C, or D, or one, two, three, and four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to set the formatted question dot answer. I'm gonna get a random number between uh, one and, or zero and three. So I'm gonna do a math up floor, math random times three and I uh, need to add one on the end of this. So this is gonna give me a random index. Did I get all that right, math.random times three? Yeah, random index between zero and three. So I'm basically gonna go ahead and decide which choice is my answer, and then I'm just gonna put that answer into my answer choices array uh, in the right spot. So this is gonna be answer choices dot splice, and then we're gonna say formatted question dot answer minus one because our answer choices are not zero base indexes uh, we need zero base index then we're not going to remove any elements and then we're going to put in loaded question dot correct answer so at this point we should have uh, answer choices should have all of our answer choices in them uh, with the correct answer in a random position so the last thing we're going to do is we're going to iterate through the answer choices do a for each and we're going to get a reference to each choice and the index that it's at and then we're going to say formatted question and we're going to get the property choice and then the index plus one uh, this might be a little tricky for you guys so i uh, just want to kind of talk through what we're doing so we're going to iterate through each of the answer choices that we have here we want to put them as uh, answer one, answer two, answer three, answer four, or choice one, two, three, four on the formatted question. So to do that, uh, we're just gonna dynamically uh, get that property. So choice plus whatever that index is plus one, and then assign that choice to that thing. Then at the end here, we're just gonna return formatted question. So let, let's, um, let's say questions equals. So let's go ahead and assign that to our regular questions and let's do a start game and see if that works all right so we've got an undefined here which looks like we're missing something on the question so question uh that shouldn't be plural that should be singular let's see if that works uh <laughs> what is the largest organ of the human body uh the large intestine probably so who is depicted on the hundred dollar bill should be benjamin franklin looks like that's right so it looks like uh we are actually pulling the questions correctly and uh, the thing we want to fix so this is super cool we we don't have to store our own questions or anything we can use this open api the one thing i want to add here is when we refresh this page you'll see that we see that dummy data first before we actually pull a question so what we're going to do in the last video is add a loader so we're not going to display any of this information until we're actually finished loading the questions and then we'll display the questions so that's going to do it for this video and i'll see you in the next one all right, in the last video, we were able to uh, load our questions from the open trivia uh, DB. So being able to call an API and load those in means we don't have to store them. We don't have to create all of our questions. Uh, this is a great use case in general for API. So if you're looking for data, see if you can find a public API in general. Uh, and then uh, in our application, when we start here, we have this, we have this kind of delay where we show some dummy question information just because we have it kind of hard-coded in here what we're gonna do let's go ahead and take this stuff out so let's delete all of these okay so we've got all of our question information hidden so now when we when we refresh uh, we should just kind of see this blank screen now this is obviously not very good right because we want to we don't want to show them just a blank screen before we load our data so this is where we're gonna come in and do our loader uh, just to kind of give the user an idea that we're taking some time to do something the game will be ready in a second so all we're going to do in our HTML is going to uh, create a div with an ID of loader. All right, so that's all we're going to do there, and it's going to sit right on top of the game. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to add the hidden class to our game to start. So we'll hide the game, and you don't see anything because we need to add our styles for loader, but we could say loading in here. So you'll see there that is. 
but we don't actually need text. What we're going to do is style that with CSS to make an actual loader. So we're going to hide our game by default, and then we'll go in and show our loader uh, initially. And then when we finish loading, we'll switch that over. And when we finish loading, we'll switch that over to show our game. So now let's open up our game CSS, and we'll add the styles at the bottom here for our loader. So what we want to, let me show you just really quickly, if you guys can see real quick what this loader looks like. Oh, well, it didn't actually show there. I guess it's coming in pretty fast, so we're not seeing it. Uh, so we'll just kind of talk through what we're doing and go from there. So we're gonna start with uh, selecting our loader, and uh, we wanna make a circle for the most part, a spinning circle. So we're gonna give a border, and this is gonna be 1.6 rem solid white. And then we'll have a border radius is 50%. So this is how we're gonna get kind of the circular effect. And we'll do a border top is 1.6 rem solid. And then this is where we're gonna use a color. So 5.6 A5EB, does that look right? Yeah. And we'll do a width of 12 rem and a height of 12 rem which again is basically uh, 120 pixels so if I save this and let it show up on the screen you can see uh, because of and actually let's just tweak a little bit of this so we can kind of break down how it's working let's select our loader and just to show you without the border radius being 50 you get kind of a square here and this makes a little bit more sense so with this uh, with it being looking like a square you can see you've got your border of white then you're basically overriding the top border to be a blue color uh, which is pretty obvious here and then uh, you've got a height and width for this to be 120 pixels, basically. So then adding in this border radius uh, makes it into a circle. So what we want to do is we want to have basically this entire thing spin. So we're going to use an animation to do that. And uh, the way we do animation is we'll do uh, keyframes. And then we'll name the animation. So we'll call it spin. And then uh, we basically want to set styles for different percentages or different, uh, different breakpoints, if that's a good way to put it, along the, the spin cycle. So we're basically just going to have a start and finish. Uh, and so it's going to start at uh, 0%. And here it's going to transform and it's going to start at 0 degrees. And you can actually type in DEG there to get degrees. And then it's going to finish by having spun not 199%, but 100%. So that's going to be the finish. And it will have rotated 360 degrees at that point. So the, and uh, this is a transform. All right, so you won't actually see anything happen now because we haven't applied this animation to our loader even after we save. So to do that, we need to say animation and we want to say we want to use the spin, an spin animation. We want it to last two seconds. We want it to be linear, which means it's going to kind of constantly uh, constantly make progress as it spins. It's not going to spin faster or slower at the beginning or the end. And then we want it to infinitely loop. And so we save here now, and we should see our loader looks pretty good. Now this is actually, if you guys are interested, uh, this is from W3 Schools uh, Build a Loader. So this is exactly what they do there. This is the quickest and easiest way that I've seen to build a loader without bringing in an extra library, doing something really, really fancy. So you guys can obviously tweak this and make it look a little bit different if you want to, but if you want an extra, just kind of written version of how to do this, you can go and look at uh, look at this example on W3 Schools. All right, so we've got so we've got our loader. Now the only thing we need to do is uh, when we load our questions, and that happens in the here. So when we when we right before we call start game. We know we've got our questions, so we're ready to show the game and hide the loader. So we wanna get a couple more uh, references to DOM objects. The first one is gonna be, and this is my get ID shortcut. First one is gonna be just loader, all right? And then the second one is gonna be game. And in here, in here, we can call game.classList and then remove the hidden class. And so just this by itself will do something a little bit weird. So it'll show these two side by side, which is not what we want. And then we want to take the loader dot class list and add hidden. So we want to basically just swap these out. Now you'll see your loader stays there at the beginning 
then as you get your questions loaded, it will go away and you can see your questions. So uh, this, this works really well. We're gonna make this a little bit better. Uh, and the way we're gonna make this a little bit better is right now we are, we are loading our questions and then showing the screen. But technically we haven't actually displayed the new question yet. So it's hard to, it's hard to see this difference because it's minute, it's milliseconds. But really the optimal way to do this is to take this and put it inside of the start game function and we'll put it right at the very end so that we don't show our game until we absolutely know that we've got our first question and it's been added and displayed on the screen. So you won't really see a difference here when we save, you'll still see the same effect. There's a loader and then uh, when, it, when, we lo when we finish loading the questions and displaying the first question, now that loader will go away and we can see our game. All right, so I think that's a pretty neat effect to add. I think this is great for user experience as well. Uh, you definitely don't want to show like dummy data uh, while the user is waiting. You also don't really want to show a blank screen. So uh, by adding a loader, you give them some sort of context to let them know that something is happening, which is really, really great. So that's going to wrap it up for this video, and I will see you in the next one. You did it. You're finished. I first want to say thank you for taking the course. And then also congratulations on making your way all the way through. Now I put a lot of time and effort into creating this content in the hopes that it provides a good learning opportunity for you. And I hope you were able to improve your core web development skills with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now I hope to see you in the future in one of my other videos, mini courses or premium courses. If you're interested in learning more about that content, you can check out learnbuildteach.com where you can see all of those things, videos, courses, et cetera, and then also subscribe to my newsletter where I'll send you notifications or emails about the content that I have when it's coming out and when you can check it out. So again, I just wanna thank you for taking the course. I really appreciate having your support. I hope it was worth it for you, and I hope to see you in the future in a future video.